In this lesson, we will talk about what might be the first tactic for just about every problem solving question on the quantitative reasoning section of the new GMAT Focus Edition, and that's going to be the technical mathematic approach. So, in the quantitative section, the technical approach may be the only reasonable tactic for some problems. Now, it is not the only way for many problems, but sometimes there just is a technical solution that you'll need to execute. It requires, however, only basic arithmetic and algebraic skills. These are the two manners in which that the quantitative section will test math. It's just basic arithmetic and basic algebra. It is not, however, necessarily associated with high difficulty problems. So it's one of the interesting paradoxes of the test is that some of the more direct technical manipulations may not actually be considered difficult by the test maker, but they may be difficult for you if you're not familiar with that particular technical aspect of the math that is being tested. Now, strategically, you do want to just about every time attempt the technical approach first, because if you can do it, it's probably the fastest way. But as soon as the approach ceases to be both apparent and simple to you in the moment, you'll have to decide to go a different route. Now, apparent simply means that you can set up the math that's presented in the problem. Simple means that you can solve it. And you'll want to note your numbering format in the problem and the choices to inform efficient calculation through the problem. So let's take a look at a word problem that you could potentially approach using a technical math method. So as always, we're going to set up the scratch pad first, listing the choices vertically A through E. But in this case, I would not recommend writing them out because they're just overly complex little uh, expressions. And that's just not necessary. And you might mistake something. It's just a step that you can kind of skip if it's a more complex structure as opposed to just a simple number. Then, as always, we're going to skip to the end of the problem to identify the sought value and label those choices as such. So we'd have A through E listed without the little expressions, but we'd write over top <clears throat> something such as number of minutes for C to travel 10 miles. Because if we skip to the end, we can read the number of minutes it would take Callum to travel 10 miles at the average of Abby's and Barry rate, Barry's rates in terms of A and B. So we'd set that up. Then we read from the beginning, taking notes and setting up equations as we go. So it says if Abby travels four miles in A minutes and Barry travels two miles in B minutes, well, we need to keep track of our distance, rate, and time formula. So we know that distance is equal to rate times time, and we can rearrange that equation for either rate and time, knowing that rate is going to be equal to the distance divided by the time, and the time is going to be equal to your distance divided by rate. So we can articulate the average of Abby and Barry's rates as 4 divided by A, so the distance divided by A minutes, and Barry, distance of 2 miles in B minutes. And that's going to be divided by 2 because there are two rates in the average. Then we have to process the fraction. So we're going to need to have a common denominator of 2AB. And we'd end up with our common denominator of 2AB underneath 4B plus 2A, because you'd have to process the addition in the numerator. You'd have A times B as that denominator. And then you'd have 4 times B over A and 2 times A over B, and the AB would be the composite of that denominator. Then we'd want to simplify the fraction. So you can see we've got a factor of 2 in both pieces of the addition in the numerator and a 2 in the denominator, so that could be simplified down to 2B plus A over AB. And then it's just a matter of solving for the time as 10. So we know that 10 would be equal to the distance, which is 10, divided by that average of rates. So then we're going to, again, have to multiply by the reciprocal, and we'd get 10AB divided by 2B plus A, which matches choice E. And if this was a lot for you to follow, you may decide not to do this. And in a future lesson, we'll actually revisit this problem itself and see how we could potentially address it with a different approach. But as you can see, it's relatively straightforward if you understand the algebraic manipulations that are occurring here. 
Now, let's take a look at an arithmetic example. So, as before, we're going to set up the scratch pad, listing out our answer choices, A through E. And in this case, there probably isn't going to be an alternative approach that's realistic. There's no variables involved. There's just a technical manipulation that we're going to need to execute. So we note the format of the choices to inform an efficient manipulations. And part of how we know that it has to be a relatively technical approach is the presence of the square root of five and the square root of three in our answer choices. Now, when you see what are known as irrational values, generally it's going to be square roots in this GMAT focus edition. You want to consider them just as an other term. You don't want to try to convert it to a decimal. You're just going to leave everything in the square root notation and simplify. So we're going to have to remove common factors to simplify the square root that is underneath with all of those different pieces of the subtraction. So We've got 27 times 10 minus 9 times 5. And I'm just going to consider it without the square root for now. So we'll bring it back in at the end. Now we pull out a 9 from each term on either side of the subtraction. So I can pull a 9 out of 27, and that leaves 3 times 10. I can pull a 9 out of 9 times 5, and that leaves 1 times 5. So you can see that factorization. Then we've got to process the parentheses inside of the big parentheses, you know, and you get these nested functions that are part of the things that they're trying to test is just your ability to track multiple pieces at one time. So we know that 3 times 10 is going to be 30, 1 times 5 is going to be 5, so we really have 9 times 25, and we're going to put our radical back in. So now we've got the square root of 9 times 25, and we can then pull out perfect squares. So the square root of 9 becomes 3 when we distribute the radical. The square root of 25 becomes 5 when we distribute, distribute the radical. And that gives us our 3 times 5 is equal to 15. So you just have to work through the steps very deliberately here. But the technical arithmetic, and in particular, if it's arithmetic in nature, the technical approach is probably going to be more singular. There's there are going to be fewer opportunities for alternative tactics when there's just arithmetic structures that don't really give you anything else. But again, make sure that you go through our lessons on things like square roots, on things like technical fractions and decimals, so that when you encounter these types of problems, you are able to execute using the rules of math that the exam doesn't necessarily value too much, but are the sorts of things that in our experience, you can improve by, our, by practice and working through these lessons, as well as some of those mathaids.com uh, practice worksheets that are available for free online. So now that we've seen some technical arithmetic, let's take a look at some technical algebra. Now, the key to this problem, when you set up the scratch pad listing the choices, you're going to just do A through E again. And I'm not going to write out the little expressions. But I do know that what we're being asked to solve for, that combination of A minus 3 times B plus 3, even though there are clearly variables in the choices and the problem, because the problem is asking for a combined value with multiple variables, in this case, we've got four different letters to, to track, four different unknowns, that's an indication that perhaps the plugging in approach isn't going to be all that efficient. Not saying you cannot do any sort of alternative plug-in approach with this problem, but if you're going to, it's going to be really time-consuming. And because you can now, in the GMAT Focus Edition, skip over problems, if you were going to need to do this problem through plugging in, you might try to do some logical evaluation first and make an educated guess. For instance, I might see that because I've got that minus three times plus three, I'm probably looking at a minus nine at the end, and I may, may make an educated decision between choices B and C. But because there's this combination structure of what the values that's being sought, you probably are going to want to engage with the technical approach first. So the first thing we're going to do is we have to distribute the quadratic. So that means we've got a FOIL. So we've got our first term, which is going to be A times B. Our outside term becomes 3 times A. Our inside terms becomes negative 3B. And our last term becomes negative 9. So we combine all of those terms to discover that 
AB plus 3A minus 3B is minus 9 is equal to that expression. Then we need to factor the 3 from the A minus B portion. So that's going to be 3 times A minus B. And at that point, we can now substitute in our values of A minus B and AB as M and N respectively. So we know that AB is equal to N, A minus B is equal to M. So we'd have N plus 3M minus 9 is equal to that expression at the beginning of A minus 3 times A, uh, sorry, B plus 3. And that we just flip around the 3M and the N and we discover our correct answer is choice C. So again, can you do this another way? Yes, the key might be a logical evaluation alternative, but the technical math, if you can do it with a clearly apparent set of algebra, because that's ultimately how you can gauge whether the technical approach is necessary, is if it's apparent, the exam is probably saying try the algebra first. Not to say you can't have some really convoluted algebra end up, but end up occurring, but here it's relatively straightforward once you just execute the distribution that's required by the standard construct of algebra. So our technical mathematics process. As always, set up the scratch pad, listing your choices vertically A through E. You can include simple numbers if they're there, but you're going to want to note the specific algebraic expressions or numbers that are in the choices. And you want to note the format of those choices to inform your tactics and calculation. Again, remember that the key with the technical approach is that it needs to be both apparent and simple to you in the moment in order to reasonably execute it. Then you want to skip to the end of the problem, label the choices at the sought value. Again, this is the part that we do every time. And it, you want to note if you're seeking a specific or non-specific value and beware of auto solving for individual values if they're seeking a combined value. You just saw in the last problem, we did not care what A was. We did not care what B was. We didn't even care what M and N were in a non-variable sense. So make sure that you're solving for what they're asking for directly. Then read from the beginning, taking notes and doing needed calculations. Take the technical path to solving if you can. But as soon as that approach ceases to be both simple and apparent in the moment, prepare to do an alternative tactic or potentially make this one of the questions that you guess in under 20 seconds and leave to potentially return to at the end of the section, provided that you have time to do so. So now let's head on over to our whiteboard and take a look at how to execute the technical math approach with an example problem that you can replicate in your own drills. Here in this problem, we just set up our scratch work as we do every time, A, B, C, D, E. We have real numbers though, so I'm gonna write them out. We've got three, five, 10, 12, and 25. And we skip to the end, we can see we're being asked for the value of y cubed is how many times the value of x squared? So y cubed equals number times x squared as our little structure. And we may note that that basically means that the number could be equal to just say like an a, an extra variable. So I could set that up as y cubed equals a times x squared and we'd be solving for A. And again, always want to set your problem up to solve for the thing that it's asking for in the most direct fashion. So I just rearrange things a little bit, and that doesn't really make a whole heck of a lot of sense to me without the structure at the beginning of the problem, but it simplifies it so that I know multiply trying to solve for whatever A is. Now, we just start taking notes at the beginning, and so we know that X times Y does not equal zero. And we now have to do our manual translations. So we've got 3x squared is means equals 60%. So that could be either 60 over 100, or I'd probably just write 0.6. And 0.6 of means multiply 20%, so 0.2. And then we've got of y cubed. And you can see we just did a manual translation and it's pretty direct as far as changing things out. So now I just need to find out what that coefficient is going to be. So I may look at this right now and there's a couple of things that I can recognize if I were to translate two fractions. So again, it's really at your discretion whether you want to multiply this through just by 100 to get rid of the decimals 
Because if I do that, I get 300 x squared is going to be equal to 6 times 2 times y cubed. And then that's going to be 300 x squared is equal to 12 y cubed. And I can divide that out by 12. And I'd probably do a little bit of long division. 12 goes into 300. And at this point, I would want to know that this has to go in two times. So it's got to be the 20 version, nothing else. If I were to finish it out, 12 goes into 30 twice. 2 times 12 is 24. Subtract that out. We're left with the 6 and a 0. 12 goes into 65 times, and there's my 25. Now, you heard me mentioning fractions. I could do it fractionally as well. Whichever is your preferred method, you should go with. But if I'm not going to do the 100 this time, if I instead started with just that 3x squared, instead of writing 0.6, I could write that as 6 tenths or 3 fifths times 0.2 or 1 fifth. And then that's times y to the third. And I might even be able to figure out what my, uh, what my multiplier, my coefficient, that A would have to be to make this all work. Because I know at this point, the 3 here, the 3 here is going to cancel out. And we're trying to get the thing to go, or the coefficient to be in front of the x squared. So I'd have to multiply this by 25. And it's the exact same thing. So do remember, you want to allow your non-integer calculation to be arithmetically ambidextrous. Because with a problem like this, there probably isn't an absolute way that I'd say is preferable, whether it's the decimal or the fraction. It's whatever is best for you in the moment and because everything else is integers, it's just what you see and how to get to that technical approach. So even when you're, you're consigned to the technical math, there's still flexibility that's allowed. You can do this fractionally, you can do this decimally, and ultimately you'll get to the right answer. So go ahead and move into some drills where you can focus on a technical approach, but recognizing that even within the technical approach, the GMAT focus is going to reward that flexibility.